each year we have a lecture that we dedicate in the memory of Robert Harris, who was one of the founders of the lecture series, in fact. And um, I'm going to introduce, now, introduce you now to Barbara Lesh McCaffrey, who will say a few words about Robert Harris, and then I'll introduce our speaker. We all know this is going to make a terrible sound. It's one of the few pieces of technology that has not caught up with the 21st century. I think this microphone was probably here when the campus was founded. As the current president of the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust and a former member of the faculty involved with the lecture series, it's a true honor to be introducing the Robert L. Harris Memorial Lecture and providing a bit of background about him and the community group that supports this unique course. Robert Harris was a World War II veteran who retired and moved with his wife Claire to Sonoma County after a distinguished career in school teaching and administration, which included directing a school for troubled youth. He became active in the Jewish community and decided that a contribution he could make was to ensure that students at all levels were educated about the Holocaust. An event in remembrance of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and I know you've probably studied a little bit about it already, had been done for years by a group in Petaluma, which then kind of transformed itself into what is now an annual community commemoration of the Shoah, referred to as Yom HaShoah. The group included Simon Jaffe, Joe Rappaport, uh, both of whom had emigrated from Europe and were in the United States during World War II, and Irv Newman, who until recently came to the lectures. Um, and Irv had been the person who coordinated these events. At an event at this campus in 1983 in the Commons, the university president, who was Peter Demondopoulos, was the keynote speaker. After the event, he challenged Robert, who was that year's coordinator, to do more than just memorialize the Holocaust annually in an event, and that began the University Community Partnership. Part of the justification for founding the group was training teachers. How many of you are planning careers in teaching? Can I see a show of hands? Thank you. And what we do in this course is relevant no matter what your major, but it was especially a wish of Robert's that this work would continue, um, particularly for those people who would touch young people as they were trying to understand the world. It soon became apparent that Sonoma State was an ideal place for a permanent program about the Holocaust. Professor John Steiner, a Holocaust survivor and a professor in the sociology department, had begun to teach classes that dealt with issues related to the Holocaust. In addition, Paul Banco, a Holocaust survivor, was a member of the faculty in the biology department, and George Jackson, a liberator, was a faculty member in our psychology department. During the spring of 83, Robert asked a number of people, including Professor Banco, to assist him in responding to the president's challenge. From what I've been told, um, Robert had an ability to persuade you to do things. And I had a feeling that if you were asked, no was not an option. One of the first people he, he tapped was Joel Newberg, who was working at the Holocaust Library and Research Center in San Francisco which was established by survivors in 1978. The center had sponsored lectures, but not a consistent program. And actually, Joel went on to become the president of this organization before me. He also invited Sylvia Sucker, a retired teacher who had recently moved to the area from New York. She knew Robert's wife, Claire, through her volunteer work with Hadassah. And we're thrilled to have Sylvia with us. One of Professor Steiner's first students, Virgil Miller, who'd been attending the memorial um, events for the Warsaw Ghetto, was also invited to join that initial group. 
Robert also added ministers, rabbis, and people like Evelyn Evie Sackler, another of Professor Steiner's students, Eugene Kravitz, Irv Newman from the Petaluma Group, and another local survivor, Walter Kuttner. When I interviewed Sylvia, she remembered Robert as an indefatigable leader with enormous determination who was able to work with all types of people, an inspiration. As Joel Newberg recalls, Robert was a one-person organization. He knew what needed to be done and interfaced with groups and individuals and handled all the fundraising. He would ask people and they would donate. I don't think I have quite the same skill. The Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust was formed on behalf of the victims and survivors of the Holocaust and the desire to tell their stories and learn from their experiences. Those who began this collaborative effort between the community and members of the university faculty promised to let the world know of the atrocities that had occurred. The initial intention was primarily learn the facts, act on them, and never forget. As a result of these efforts, a highly successful lecture series on the Holocaust and genocide was created at the university that was initially five to six lectures a year and grew into this general education course that currently enrolls 100 students each year. Professor Steiner became the first director of the Center for the Study of the Holocaust at Sonoma State, and Professor Myrna Goodman, then a returning adult student working toward her bachelor's degree, was the first student assistant hired by the center. Almost from, it, from its inception, the series has also included lectures on other genocides. As a university community partnership, the Alliance Board now includes members of the community, university faculty, and administrators, and students who have participated in the Holocaust lecture series. If you're currently on the Alliance Board, would you stand? And watch out, we have our student reps here in the back. Thank you so much. The, the current mission of the Alliance is to co-sponsor the lecture series. The university pays the faculty salaries. We raise the money to bring all the guest speakers to you. We support the Center for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide in providing programming to the larger community, including kindergarten through 12th grade teachers and collaborate with other community groups working with issues related to the Holocaust and genocide. After Robert's death, the members of the Alliance decided to name an annual lecture in this series as a tribute to his unswerving dedication and commitment to Holocaust education. We are truly indebted to Robert for his vision and his leadership. For those of you interested in the history of the series, now in its 26th year, there's a binder on the stage um, which has the flyers for almost all of the lectures. The last few have yet to be added. My sense is they'll be in the binder by Sunday. We also hope that many of you will be able to join us this coming Sunday afternoon at 3 for the dedication of the Arthur and Erna Somm Holocaust and Genocide Memorial Grove at the Lakes, where many of those involved with the series will be remembered. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. I was also Dr. Steiner's student. One of the things that we prided our <laughs> ourselves on <laughs> as we present the series is the ability to present to the, an audience of uh, students and people who are is, interested in the history of the Holocaust and the factors behind many of the uh, genocides is to present scholars who have a unique uh, and very interesting research subject matter. Um, although there have probably been 500,000 books written about the Holocaust, there are still places that are unknown and un discovered. Um, our author tonight is one of the people who has gone to one of those corners, um, although it's a very prominent one. L little has been written about the Minsk ghetto, 
the underground, the communist-led resistance, and the local population's cooperation with the Jews in German-occupied Bielorussia. Professor Epstein drew in on interviews with Jewish ghetto survivors and partisan fighters. She tells a story that stands in stark contrast to what transpired across much of Eastern Europe. Professor Epstein will talk about the Minsk ghetto and the ordinary citizens, Jews and Belarusians, who risked their lives to create an alliance against the Nazis. Barbara Epstein is the history, uh, a professor in the History of Consciousness Department at the U University of California at Santa Cruz. She's the author of Political Protest and Cultural Revolution, Nonviolent Direct Action in the 70s and 80s, among other books. Will you join me in welcoming Barbara Epstein? The book's up. Now, thank you very much uh, for that lovely introduction. Um, and I'm very honored to be speaking particularly at this special lecture. Um, and I want to make sure that everybody can hear me. Uh, is this OK? Good. All right. Well, um, <laughs> OK, now, is this all right? All right, then I don't have to stand on tiptoe. <laughs> That'll do it. Thank you. Well, <laughs> yes. Um, like many American Jews, and probably like many Americans in general, I grew up hearing stories about the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, the Vilna Ghetto, uh, generally about the Holocaust and about Holocaust resistance in Poland and Lithuania. Um, and uh, the the, the message that uh, those were stories in which Jews fought alone in the ghettos uh, heroically with very little support from, the outs from outside the ghettos, particularly uh, virtually no organized support, that is, from organizations outside the ghettos. There were uh, individual Poles, large numbers of individual Poles, actually, and some Lithuanians who risked their lives helping ghetto resistance movements. Um, but in both cases, organized uh, support from outside the ghetto was negligible. Um, in Poland, actually, the main Polish resistance to the Nazi occupation, the Home Army, uh, uh, was so reluctant to help the Jews that one can almost accuse them of trying to undermine the ghetto resistance. Uh, and when the ghetto uprising happened in Warsaw, the Home Army uh, reneged on the promises that it had made to the, to the ghetto underground. Um, and so when it, it's accurate to say that uh, in the ghettos of Poland and Lithuania, the Jews were abandoned by uh, most of the organizations and most local citizens. Um, the lesson that is often drawn from this experience uh, is that uh, in a crunch, uh, people of ethnic groups will only help people of their own groups, uh, and that anti-Semitism runs so deep that uh, Jews should be cautious about trusting others. Well. Uh, uh, and this was true, by the way, not only of organizations, but in many areas of the local citizenry. Jan Gross, um, uh, the historian Jan Gross, several years ago published a book called Neighbors, in which he describes the town of Jedwabne in Poland, eastern Poland, where at a signal from the occupying Germans, the mayor of the town organized gangs of Poles, uh, who proceeded to murder almost all the Jews in town. The town before the war was about half Jewish, half ethnic Polish. Uh, by the time this massacre was over, there were only, I believe, 12 Jews left alive. So this is the kind of thing that was going on, uh, particularly in the eastern part of Poland and the eastern part of Lithuania. Well, uh, 
I happened to come across a very different story uh, in Minsk, uh, which was then in uh, Soviet Belarusia, Soviet Belarusia, which was occupied by the Germans. Uh, now in Belarus, it's basically the same country. Uh, Minsk is approximately 200 miles east of Yedvabne, not very far by modern standards. And yet what happened there was very, very different. Uh, what happened was that the, there was a ghetto resistance organization organized and led by communists, which was part of a larger communist resistance in the city of Minsk, uh, in which Jews and Belarusians regularly risked their lives to maintain contact between the two sectors of the underground uh, and helped each other whenever necessary. The, uh, the uh, you could either say that it was two underground organizations, a Jewish underground organization in the ghetto and a Belarusian underground organization outside the ghetto, closely aligned with each other. Officially, of course, it was one underground organization. This communist underground was surrounded by a periphery of uh, what people called the spontaneous resistance which meant groups of people who, came, who were not part of the underground, but who came together with uh, uh, friends and acquaintances to do what they could to oppose the Germans. These were mostly young people. Uh, and in that arena too, Jews and Belarusians work together very closely. Most of the stories that I've heard are of networks that involved both Jews and Belarusians. Um, so, I'm, what I'm going to do is first tell you how I happened to do this research, then tell you, try to describe what the resistance in the ghetto was like and how it was intertwined with the Belarusian resistance outside the ghetto. And then I'm going to give you uh, my analysis of why things were so different in Minsk than they were elsewhere. Uh, why something like this could happen in Minsk when it did not happen in the better known ghettos in Poland and Lithuania. Um, so the first thing I should say is that I am actually an American historian. And what I mean by that is not just that I'm a US citizen, but that my degree is in US history. Um, I think in sociology, the standards are a little bit more enlightened, but in the historical profession, um, uh, I am considered um, the, uh, uh, I was considered to be unqualified for the work that I did, because in history, you're supposed to be trained in a particular national history in order to, to do work in that, uh, in that arena. So in a certain sense, I am poaching on other people's, other people's territory. Um, the way I happened to do this research was that I was studying Yiddish uh, in a, an intensive Yiddish program at the University of Vilnius. Uh, and the assignment for my class was to do some research on Jewish history in Vilnius, write it up in Yiddish, and give a presentation to the class in Yiddish. And part of the reason all of this was in Yiddish was that the, about a third of the people in the class were Belarusians who didn't speak any English. So Yiddish was the lingua franca of the class. Um, I happen to know that there were a couple of women in Vilnius who had been members of the Vilna Ghetto Underground. So I interviewed them and I wrote up my interviews, presented them to the class. And a woman in the class who was a, a Jewish woman from Minsk told me that if I was interested in Jewish resistance, I should come to Minsk because, she said, there were circles of people in Minsk who had participated in the ghetto underground who were still living in Minsk and she could, could introduce me to them. So that's what I did. I took a quarter off from teaching and I went to Minsk. I did not know a soul in the entire country. Um, I had studied Russian in college, but that was a long time ago and my Russian was really rusty. Um, so actually what I did was I got on an email list called the Belarus email list, which turned out to be a listserv of Belarusian emigres. And I sent out a question asking if anybody knew how I could get in touch with the Association of Ghetto Survivors in Minsk. 
Somebody wrote back and said that I should get in touch with the head rabbi and gave me an email address. So I wrote to this person who I thought was the head rabbi who responded in perfect English um, and his name was Franklin Swartz and I began to suspect that he was not the head rabbi. Um, it turned out that he was an American Jew who had found himself in Minsk, had married a uh, Jewish Belarusian woman who happened to be a professional translator. And they were running a little project on uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish history in, in Belarus under the aegis of one of the Orthodox uh, synagogues in Minsk. And so they took my project under their wing. Um, and they helped me with it. And that is really how I was able to do it. They found a translator for me who a former uh, Jewish partisan, then about 75 years old, who spoke five languages fluently, which is, by the way, not unusual for Jews of that generation in that part of the world. And I went to Minsk, and Grisha Hasid and I ran around Minsk uh, using a list of names that was supplied to us actually by the two associations of ghetto survivors. Just as there always have to be two synagogues, there have to be two associations of ghetto survivors. But they were both very helpful. And so we interviewed 18 people um, during the period I was there. And what I found was so different than what I had expected that at first I thought the project was not going anywhere and this was not Jewish history. Because what I was used to was stories in which explicitly Jewish organizations, primarily Zionist organizations, led resistance in the ghetto on their own in heroic isolation without any significant support from the outside. What I heard from my interviewees were stories of networks of people, including Jews and Belarusians, Jews inside the ghetto, Belarusians outside the ghetto, who had worked together in all kinds of creative ways to oppose the Germans, uh, and then enabled the Jews to go to the partisans in the forest. Um, so finally, fortunately, it occurred to me that what I was finding was interesting precisely because it wasn't what I had expected. And so I kept going back to Minsk and interviewing people. I also went to Israel, actually, and interviewed survivors of the Minsk ghetto in Israel. Uh, ultimately, I interviewed about 50 survivors of the Minsk ghetto who had engaged in resistance. And I also discovered that there were stacks and stacks of memoirs in the National Archives uh, that had been deposited by participants in the resistance in the years after the war. Um, and so, of course, the people I was interviewing were relatively young at the time. They were mostly in their late teens, at oldest in their mid to late 20s. But by using these um, memoirs in the archives, I was also able to get the stories of people who had been older than that and who had died before I was able to begin my research. Um, so that's, I mean, I also used other sources. There's also a set of uh, interviews in Israel done in Yiddish uh, of survivors of the Minsk ghetto who arrived in Israel in the late 60s, and there are other sources as well. But basically my sources were interviews with survivors and the written memoirs of survivors. So, um, uh, I want to tell you what I found out, uh, what the resistance was like. First of all, by way of background, this map will help you, I think. Um, on June 22, 1941, uh, the Germans invaded the Soviet Union. And what they, that meant was that they uh, swept into, uh, is, is this map organized in a way that they, they swept into Ukraine and uh, what was then Soviet Belarusia, now Belarus. Um, they, uh, they were able to go through the, th through the countryside very fast because the Red Army was given orders to withdraw to the east. Uh, the Red Army withdrew. The strategy of the Soviet Union was to pull all of its soldiers out of occupied territory, 
the Soviets thought that within a matter of weeks, they would be able to turn around and push the Germans out. The Germans, meanwhile, thought the opposite. They thought that within a few weeks, they were going to get to Moscow and they would defeat the Soviet Union. Both of these predictions turned out to be utterly wrong. Uh, the war went on until 1944. Well, what this meant was that uh, uh, with the Red Army withdrawing from Belarus, uh, it withdrew so fast that many soldiers were left behind, trapped in occupied territory. Word went around among uh, Red Army soldiers who found themselves trapped in occupied territory that if they were caught by the Germans, they would be put in prisoner of war camps where they were very likely to die. And so they formed groups, many of them formed groups and went to the forest. And this was the beginnings of the partisan movement. Uh, Belarusia became the center of the Soviet, the Red Army aligned partisan movement. And this was to have a lot of importance for Jewish resistance in the area. Um, in the days when the Germans were taking over Belarusia, uh, many people tried to flee, particularly communists and people close to the Communist Party who knew that they would be vulnerable once the Germans took over. There were many Jews who were in or close to the Communist Party, but Jews who were not in that category were confused about what German rule would be like. The Soviet Union had been screening out any negative information about the Nazi treatment of the Jews. Um, and older Jews remembered how German soldiers had behaved during World War I, and they behaved well. Uh, on top of that, uh, many people couldn't leave. The Communist Party leaders in Minsk immediately got into their cars and drove towards Moscow. They got out in time. You have to remember that Minsk, Minsk did not look like Warsaw. Minsk was a very provincial town. Very few people in Minsk had cars other than the communist leaders. Um, many people uh, began either got on their bicycles and began riding towards Moscow, or else they began walking. But in most cases, the German soldiers got there first and they were turned back. And so thousands of Jews and others were turned back and were forced to spend the years of the German occupation in Minsk. Um, well, uh, the first thing that happened was that the Germans announced that uh, the Germans ordered all men between the ages of 15 and 45 to come to a particular public square so as to register. Some men, particularly communists, were smart enough to hide instead, but many did go. They were loaded into trucks. They were taken to a hastily constructed camp outside of town. The Jews and the Belarusians were divided. They were put in different sectors. Um, within a day or so, the Belarusians were let go, but the Jews were kept in this camp where they were given neither food nor water. Um, uh, eventually, a German officer came and asked all those who had higher educations and who worked with their brains rather than with their hands to step forward. Um, most Jewish intellectuals thought this meant they would be treated better than others, and so they stepped forward. The doctors and engineers were told to step back. The others were put on trucks. Uh, they were taken to a camp 10 miles away, and they were all shot. Uh, about 3,000 of Minsk's male intellectuals were shot right at the beginning of the war. This meant, among other things, that the resistance in the ghetto was very much a working class resistance in which very few people had any education beyond a high school education. Well, meanwhile, the Germans had put posters around town that said that all Jews had to go into a particular neighborhood of the town. Um, this was what had been the traditional Jewish neighborhood. Uh, they described the perimeter of it. It's an area of about 20 blocks or so. Um, and the poster said that all Belarusians had to move out of this area and all Jews had to move into it. 
for those of you who know New York, this would be a little bit like saying that all Jews in the city of New York have to move into the Lower East Side. Um, and because by this time, Jews were living everywhere in Minsk. Um, so, but this was what happened because the poster said that any Jew found outside this area after August 1st would be shot. Um, so Belarusians moved out of the area, Jews moved in, the crowding in the area, as you can imagine, was absolutely horrendous. People were living 15 to 30 to a room. Um, the Germans uh, put a barbed wire fence around what was now the ghetto. Now the barbed wire fence was very significant because this is, most ghettos were surrounded by brick walls. And the fact that there was a barbed wire fence and also that it was, it was uh, guarded by policemen who walked around its periphery and not by fixed sentries. What this meant was that you could get out. You could cut a hole in the fence, you could dig a hole underneath the fence, and you could go out. It was extremely dangerous. You would be shot if you were caught doing that, but it was possible. Uh, whereas in places like Bialystok, Warsaw, and so forth, it was much more difficult. Um, all able-bodied Jews uh, were organized into work brigades. They were marched out of the ghetto every morning, mostly to work in German military factories outside the ghetto. Uh, and they were marched back to the ghetto at night. And they got small amounts of food at work, a bit of bread and some soup. Uh, those who didn't work outside the ghetto, which meant the children, women with small children, elderly people, people who were sick, uh, were likely to starve unless somehow they got food from outside the ghetto. And so many children and teenagers regularly went outside the ghetto to get food for their families. There was also a trade, by the way, at the fence between Jews and Belarusians, which was totally illegal. Um, and you could be arrested for being involved in that trade, but that also helped Jews to survive. Um, uh, the Germans used the ghetto for two purposes. One was as a, uh, as a source of slave labor, and that's what I've been describing. Um, but the other was, it was also a death camp. The Germans periodically went into the, into the ghetto, uh, took out thousands of Jews, and shot them. And one of the things that was different about Minsk than other ghettos was the Germans did this totally openly. They made no effort to disguise what they were doing, either to the inhabitants of the ghetto or to the local population. Um, there was a Judenrat in the ghetto, uh, you know, in other words, a council appointed by the Germans whose role ostensibly was to carry out German orders inside the ghetto. What made the Minsk Judenrat different from other Judenrats, and I'm about to tell you about the underground, is that every member of the Judenrat was a member of the underground. Uh, that was true for the first seven or eight months of the ghetto until the Germans figured out what was going on, at which point they all started to be arrested and executed. Um, um, well, uh, the underground, the way the underground was formed was soon after the Jews were forced into the ghetto, small groups of communists and people whom they trusted began meeting secretly to talk about what they could do to oppose the Germans. This was taking place both inside the ghetto and among Belarusians outside the ghetto. At first, there was no talk of forming an underground. And the reason for that was that everybody was convinced that the communist leadership must have left an official committee charged with forming an underground. And they felt that it would be stepping on the toes of the official underground for them to form one. Um, there was a little group of Polish communists in the ghetto. There were many Jews who had been pushed east and found themselves trapped in Minsk and found themselves in the ghetto. <laughs> the Polish communists said, well, you know, first of all, we're not convinced that there's such an official committee, but if there is one, the best way to find it is to form an underground. Um, so eventually, there was a meeting outside the ghetto to form a Minsk communist underground. The way the two sides came together was there was a Jewish teenager, uh, a guy named Zhenya, 17 years old, 
who had stayed outside the ghetto because he looked relatively non-Jewish. Um, he went in and out of the ghetto regularly to visit his family in the ghetto. He came in contact with the underground groups outside the ghetto and inside the ghetto, and he arranged a meeting between them. Um, so in late November or early December, depending on which version you read, a meeting was held, a secret meeting was held right outside the ghetto in which the, an auxiliary Minsk communist underground was formed. Auxiliary, so to, to signal to the real underground that they weren't stepping on their toes. Um, the word auxiliary, by the way, was soon dropped because the real underground was never found because it didn't exist. Um, at any rate, from that point on, there was, and the underground, both inside and outside the ghetto, was organized into what were called desyatkas, in other words, groups of ten. Um, the idea was that only the leader of a group of ten would know the identities of people in his or her group, um, and the, that uh, he or she would then communicate with the uh, central committee um, and this was all so that if the Germans caught anyone, they would know as few names as possible. This is what was called the rules of conspiracy. Um, well, and meanwhile, in addition to this organized underground, gradually, not at first, but um, uh, within the second year of the existence of the ghetto, groups particularly of young people, began to come together to figure out what they could do. Now, when I interviewed people, it was mostly the young people who had been part of the quote-unquote spontaneous underground, because they were mostly 16, 17 years old, maybe in their early 20s at the time of the war. Uh, the communist underground included many people who were in their 20s, 30s, 40s, even a few in their 50s, and obviously many of those people were no longer alive when I did my research. So I relied, even though I was able to interview some of those people, I relied very largely on their memoirs for their stories. Well, what I want to tell you about is um, three of the projects, three and a half projects actually, in which Belarusians and Jews work together to oppose the Nazis. Um, and in, in some cases, this was strictly the organized underground. In some cases, as you'll see, it involved people, the spontaneous groups outside the un organized underground as well. The first one, and the one that was considered most important by the underground organization, was the project of sending people to the partisans, people and supplies. The ghetto underground had decided very early in its history that its strategy was not to try to mobilize an armed uprising inside the ghetto. One person suggested that, and the others said, what's the point of that? The Germans have all the guns, we'll just get killed. Um, uh, and so the strategy instead, instead was to try to send as many Jews as possible to the partisan units forming in the forest uh, around Minsk. And of course, what was crucial for this was, first of all, the fact that the fence was barbed wire, rather, so it was possible to get people in and out, um, and also the fact that Minsk was surrounded by forest. Uh, you, uh, by 1942, uh, you could reach a partisan unit by walking for a day and a half. Um, well, this was also the strategy of the Belarusian underground. The idea was to support the partisan effort as much as possible. Well, cooperation between the two underground groups had obvious benefits. It was much easier for the Belarusian underground to make contact with large numbers of partisan units because they could walk freely through the forest, whereas Jews could not. On the other hand, the Jews had the advantage of being able to gather supplies to send to the underground. Uh, they did this because there were so many Jews who worked in German military factories, um, and particularly underground members who did this, uh, stole weapons parts and brought them back to the ghetto. Um, now, this was, by the way, one of the ways in which it was very important that the Judenrat was essentially the above-ground arm of the underground. Uh, the head of the Jewish police was a member of the underground. 
Uh, and so there was one underground group in which there were several teenage girls who were employed in a German military factory. They would come back every day with weapons parts in their boots or in, you know, carried in some other way. A policeman, a Jewish policeman, who was a member of the underground would be stationed at the gate at the moment when they were coming back. The Jewish policeman would go out to meet them. They would give him the weapons parts that they had brought back so that they could walk through the gate and be checked by a German soldier without being endangered. Meanwhile, he would be able to walk through the gate because he was not under suspicion carrying weapons parts. Those weapons parts would be taken to a secret hiding place in the ghetto, and then they would be sent to the partisans. Um, there were many Jewish doctors in the ghetto. Uh, they were over-prescribing medicine for their patients. Um, they would then pocket the part of the medicine that was unnecessary, and they would save it to send to the, uh, to the partisans. There were workshops in the ghetto that were supervised by the Judenrat. This was part of the job of the Judenrat to produce mittens and things like that for the German soldiers. So the Judenrat saw to it that a large proportion of what was produced in those workshops was saved and sent to the partisans, and so on. You know, that was the kind of thing that was going on in the ghetto. Um, well, uh, uh, and I think an important difference between the Minsk ghetto and the Warsaw ghetto and other ghettos outside this area was that the aim was not to have an armed uprising in which everybody would be killed, but rather to send as many Jews as possible to the forest with the hope of taking revenge against the Germans and perhaps surviving. And that was the reason why there was widespread support in the ghetto for the underground. Many people in the ghetto would have loved to have gotten into the underground, but they couldn't find it because security was very tight. Um, uh, uh, second joint project, underground printing presses. Um, printing and typesetting had been largely Jewish occupations in Minsk before the war whole series of printing presses, of underground printing presses, were created. Uh, uh, the first one involved a group of printers who were members of the ghetto underground. They did the typesetting and printing. Uh, Yellow Russians took on most of the role of gathering the material for the presses. Uh, and the quote-unquote newspaper, which was really uh, kind of an, uh, uh, an expanded newsletter, uh, was distributed by Belarusians throughout the city and by Jews in the ghetto. Uh, every printing press that was created was found by the Germans. Everybody was killed, but every time a printing press was destroyed, another one would be created. Um, the third project that I want to tell you about, however, is my favorite because it had no military purpose. This was the project of rescuing children from the ghetto. The way it started was that a group of uh, several women inside the ghetto, members of the underground, and several women who were members of the underground outside the ghetto, began working together to get children out of the ghetto uh, and rescue them. Uh, the steering committee, the city committee, the steering committee of the Minsk underground as a whole found out about this and they decided to make it an official project of the Minsk underground and they assigned other comrades to work on this. This was one of the most dangerous things one could do in Minsk because it involved regularly crossing the border, going in and out of the ghetto. The way it worked was that there were two Belarusian women, members of the underground, who lived in apartments that were just outside the ghetto. That you know, you imagine there's a street around the ghetto, and they both live in apartments that are on the other side of the street on the second floor. So, for instance, Elena Voronova, who was one of these women, could sit at her window, look out the window, and see whether there was a policeman near the fence. And if not, she would get a hand signal. A Jewish woman, member of the underground, waiting behind the fence, would have a child with her, or several children, and she would then, depending on the age of the children, either send them under the fence to meet a 
an underground woman, a Belarusian woman on the other side of the street, or if the children were too young, she would go with them and go across the street. The children would be handed over to a Belarusian woman on the other side of the street. She would take them to the home of a member of the underground who had been gathering children's clothes uh, so that they would, could wear clothes that would be you know, not as tattered as the clothes of children from the ghetto. And then they would either be taken to one of Minsk's orphanages uh, or to the home of a member of the underground, basically depending on whether they could speak Russian without a Yiddish accent or not. The question was whether they would be identified or not. Well, this was a project in which lots of people were involved. The underground was involved in this. The way the underground was involved in it was there were 17 orphanages in Minsk before the war. During the war, 16 of those orphanages were hiding Jewish children. Um, uh, the head of the ghetto underground, Misha Gebelev, got together with a man named Vasily Orlov, who, was, who worked in Minsk City Hall, now you realize under working for the Germans. Uh, he ran the office for orphaned and abandoned children. And Gebelev and Orlov agreed that any child who was brought to his office between 9 and 11 in the morning, he could assume was a Jewish child who was in urgent need of being put in a place where he or she would be taken care of. Um, uh, during the war, the Germans assigned responsibility for the orphanages to the various religious denominations. What this was about was that uh, food was very scarce in Minsk. Of course, conditions were much worse in the ghetto, but even outside the ghetto, people had hardly anything to eat because the Germans were taking everything. Um, so the Germans told, they called in the heads of the various religious denominations and said, OK, you're responsible for the following two orphanages. And that means you have to get food for them, and you have to see that they operate. So a man named Anton Kietzko, who was the head of the Evangelical Baptists, was called in by Ivanovsky, who was the mayor of Minsk, working, you have to remember, for the Germans. And Ivanovsky said to Kietzko, well, you're going to be in charge of orphanages number two and number seven. You have to gather food for them. You have to see that everything works well. He said, when you go to the orphanages, you will see that there are Jewish children there. He said, we have about 600 Jewish orphan orphans in Minsk right now. This was the beginning of the war. Um, he said, the fact that they're Jewish doesn't matter. What matters is that we have to save their lives. Um, so Kietzko was directed to work with the directors of each of these orphanages to disguise the Jewish children. Well. There were various things you could do to disguise Jewish children. The Germans tended to identify Jews by dark hair and dark eyes. So one thing you could do is you could shave the heads of Jewish children and claim that they had lice. Um, you could also, of course, hang crosses around their necks. Um, but the problem was that there were five girls in one of these orphanages whose facial features were such that Kietzko and uh, uh, Vera Leonardovna, who was the head of that orphanage, were afraid that they might be identified. Well, the solution came through um, uh, a German civilian who was working in City Hall who showed up in Kietzko's congregation. Um, uh, Ketsko got to know this man. His name was um, uh, Kruger, I think. Um, and Kruger, who was also an evangelical Baptist, uh, and there was a third evangelical Baptist involved in this, but Kruger began uh, giving Ketsko information about when surprise German inspections of the orphanages were to be held. They, a 10-year-old girl, Olga, um, in the orphanage was appointed as the liaison because it was too dangerous for the adults to be seen talking to each other. So she would go to Rapietsky, the other uh, Belarusian uh, uh, evangelical Baptist, and she would also go to Kruger. 
They would tell her when there were going to be inspections. She would go back and tell Vera uh, Leonardovna, who would tell Kietzko. Uh, and several hours before the inspection was held, what, would, what happened was that the Germans would, would arrive unannounced. They would say, OK, we want you to bring all of the children out of the orphanage, line them up so that we can count them, make sure there are the right number of girls and boys, and make sure there are no Jews. Um, and the heads of the orphanages uh, uh, hung signs on the orphanage that said typhoid, typhoid cases inside. And the Germans were, of course, terrified of, of uh, uh, typhus, so they would not go inside. So, but there were still, they would still line up the children, and there had to be the right number of children there, and they had to not look like Jews. So, Kietzko would come to the orphanage uh, several hours before the inspection was to take place. He would bring his two daughters and the three daughters of a neighbor. Uh, the girls would change into the rags of orphans. Meanwhile, the five Jewish girls would be hidden inside the orphanage. Uh, and when the Germans arrived, the five girls, Kietzko's daughters and his neighbor's daughters, would join the line uh, and stand there uh, taking the place of Jewish children. Um, I interviewed one of the girls who had participated in this, and she said that as far as they were concerned, she, for her and the other kids, the whole thing was a lark because they were fooling the Germans. Um, and of course, they were told what they should say if the Germans should ask them questions, uh, but they were never told that they were doing anything dangerous. Uh, now, in fact, of course, if the Germans had figured out what was going on, the girls would have been killed, Kietzko would have been killed, the head of the orphanage would have been killed, God knows who else would have been killed. Uh, but the Germans never figured out what was going on. And according to Kietzko's memoir, there were 132 children in the two orphanages combined at the end of the war. Uh, of those, 72 were Jews and all of them survived the war. So this gives you an idea of what was going on. And I tell you this story partly because the communist underground was involved in this, but many people in addition to the communist underground were also involved. Um, how am I doing on time? Um, yes, okay. Um, well, uh, I think, um, do I have time to tell another story or would that be? Okay. Yeah, all right. How many people here have seen the film Defiance? Has anybody seen it? Um, that's a film about a partisan unit in Western Belarus uh, in which uh, uh, Jews who could not fight, um, Jewish women, children, and others, were protected during the war by Jews who organized the unit. Well, there was something like that in Eastern Belarus as well, which is the area that I'm talking about. Western Belarus, by the way, had been Poland uh, before the war, so it was culturally very different. It had not been under communist rule. Um, uh, what happened in Western Belarus, uh, in Eastern Belarus, was the following. In the spring of 1942, uh, a group left, a group of Jews left from the ghetto, went to the forest, uh, were joined by some Belarusians, and they discovered that they needed a leader with military experience. Uh, this message was con conveyed back to the ghetto, and as it happened, there was a group of Jews uh, who, were, who had jobs in a prisoner of war camp, the Shirokaya camp. Um, the most important was a woman uh, named Sonia Kurlanskaya, uh, who was the assistant to the head of the, kind of, of the prisoner of war camp. Um, she was the translator and the secretary. The reason, and there were others who did menial work in the camp, the reason they were there was to help prisoners of war escape and help them to get to the partisans. Well, she had noticed or had found out that there was a Red Army lieutenant um, in the prisoner of war camp by the name of Semyon Ganzenko. And so 
when she heard that a military leader was needed in the forest, uh, she worked with, she met with the ghetto underground to figure out how to get Gonzenko uh, out of the prisoner of war camp. What they did was they put Gonzenko and several other prisoners of war into garbage cans uh, with garbage in it, and they gave them straws to breathe through. Uh, the menial, the Jewish menial workers in the camp, among other things, had the responsibility of taking garbage out of the camp. Uh, so they put these garbage cans on a truck, and they drove the truck out of the camp. And at a prearranged place, they stopped. Uh, they took the, they allowed the men to get out of the garbage cans. And there was a young woman there, a young Jewish woman, who was a liaison for the partisans, who was there to meet them. And she led the men to the forest, uh, where Gonzenko became a uh, leader of the partisan movement. He rose in the partisan movement. And he gained a reputation as a decent man, and in particular, as a friend of the Jews. Um, Late in the war, when many Jews were escaping from the ghetto and wandering around the forest, uh, not knowing where to go, several members of the ghetto underground, who were now in partisan units in the forest, approached Gonzenko and asked him to create a special unit for the protection of Jews. Uh, at first, Gonzenko said this was crazy, that this was against any military rules he had ever heard of, but he reconsidered and he created a unit for the protection of Jews. He donated 18 of his fighters and their weapons to the unit, and eventually the unit included 600 to 700 Jews, who again all survived the war. Um, uh, I don't think that, and the difference with the film Defiance is that this was done uh, uh, by the initiative of the Red Army Aligned Partisan Movement, which is not what happened in Western Belarus. Okay, so the question is, why did this kind of thing go on in Minsk and not in places like Warsaw uh, and Vilna? And I'll give you my hypotheses. First of all, Vilna, uh, Minsk had been under Soviet rule for two decades. Uh, Minsk was the capital, capital of Soviet Belarusia. The children who had gone to schools in Minsk for the past two decades had been taught Soviet ideology. Among other things, they were taught the uh, slogan of the friendship of people of different nationalities. Uh, this was the period in which the Soviet Union was conducting a vigorous campaign against anti-Semitism. Uh, and, uh, 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 having friends of different nationalities was considered a sign that one was an intelligent, upstanding, non-prejudiced person uh, and also a patriot. Uh, there was Jewish integration in Poland and Lithuania as well, but it was a fact of life. It was not something that one felt proud of and it was not something that was identified with patriotism. In Soviet Belarusia, it was identified with patriotism, and there were many young people who were proud of having friends of different nationalities. Now, this is not to say that there wasn't anti-Semitism in Minsk, but from my interviews with young people in Minsk, I would say that among the young generation, Jews did not feel anti-Semitism. Among their elders, it may have been a different matter. Now, of course, the problem with this explanation is it doesn't answer what about Ukraine? After all, Ukraine was also under Soviet rule. And there I would say the answer is that Belarus uh, was an odd little corner of Eastern Europe, uh, which unlike its neighbors, uh, in which unlike its neighbors, nationalism had never taken hold. Uh, nationalism was rampant and vigorous in all of the areas surrounding Belarus. Um, through the 19th century, uh, anti-Semitism had been largely based on religious prejudice, but in the 20th century, it was largely right-wing nationalism, anti-communist nationalism, that drove anti-Semitism. Well, in Belarus, there was a tiny little nationalist organization, uh, never took hold very widely, and that nationalist organization, which consisted of 
Belarusian students largely, was social democratic in its orientation. It looked towards a multicultural Belarus, uh, and it worked closely with Jews. This was very much unlike the kind of uh, nationalism that existed, say, in Poland, which was about Poland for the Poles. Um, so nationalism was not an issue in Belarus, and anti-communism was not an issue. There were people who grumbled about communist rule, but uh, Belarus actually had a better experience with Soviet communism than any other region of the Soviet Union, uh, at least in um, uh, the Western Soviet Union. So organized anti-communism really did not exist. The result of this was that when the Germans went to eastern Poland and they said to villagers, the Jews are responsible for all your problems, the villagers said, well, yeah, that makes sense to us. When they went to Belarus, uh, at least to Minsk, and they said the Jews are responsible for all your problems, the Belarusians said, we think you're responsible for our problems. <laughs> we didn't have any problems until you people got, there, got here. And the memoirs of German soldiers report that they were stunned to find that in Minsk they could not mobilize pogroms against the Jews, and the attitude of the Belarusians seemed to be, on the whole, that Jews were human beings like anybody else, uh, and that once the Germans got through killing the Jews, they would probably start killing the Belarusians, which is exactly what they did. Um, so that's my explanation for why this was going on, and I think I do need to stop. Am I right? take some questions, and then after that, um, we're going to see a short uh, DVD about the um, Holocaust and Genocide Memorial Grove, which will be dedicated on Sunday, and I hope many of you can come. So questions? Michael. Uh, how long did it take you to compile all this research? A very long time. I started in 1999. And I think my last trip to Minsk was in uh, 2006, something like that. You spoke a lot about the ghetto. Could you speak about what happened outside of the ghetto in terms of Jews who were rounded up? Was it similar to what happened in Lithuania and Latvia where they were killed by the Nazi shot in there? Yeah. The, the thing that was different was that um, uh, the Germans created makeshift ghettos outside of Minsk, uh, and all of those ghettos were destroyed relatively soon. Um, uh, and again, what's striking about it is that they made no effort to disguise what they were doing from the local population, whereas in Poland and Lithuania, they went to great efforts to disguise what they were doing. Um, my hunch, by the way, about that is I think there are probably two reasons. One was I think the Germans were overstretched mm -hmm. in Belarus. I think they had expected to defeat the Soviet Union very fast, and they were astonished when it turned out that that didn't happen. They had troops fighting on the Eastern Front, and so they were sort of scrambling elsewhere. But I think the other factor was I think the Germans believed their own propaganda. I think they believed that it was the Jews who had brought communism to the Soviet Union and that every right-thinking non-Jew would hate the Jews and would applaud when the Germans killed them. Um, and at least in Belarusia, it turned out to be quite different than what the Germans expected. persuaded by your uh, explanation of it. He's um, a historian. Uh, my, uh, my, question, uh, my first question is, uh, what happens to the, uh, the uh, spontaneous uprising after 44 when it's reoccupied uh, by the Red Army? What do you mean by this? You mean? Well, you know, Marxist-Leninists are always, we're always uh, uneasy with that word, spontaneous, uh -huh. in, in the Russian word, stikhini, they, they mm -hmm. always juxtapose with the phrase, ni slučana, mm -hmm. uh, right? In, uh, in uh, Fadiev, Alexander Fadiev, the, uh, the Soviet writer actually got in trouble when he wrote a novel about the 
the partisans, the young guard, uh, and they were seen as too spontaneous. So they right. didn't have a, uh, an enlightened uh, party figure right. who was leading them. Uh, and so that, that's my first question. My second question is, is how do you square this all with uh, the very palpable official anti-Semitism of the late Stalin years? Right. Uh, first question. Um, I hate it when people say this, but it actually happens to be a really good question because it allows me to tell you something I wouldn't have been able to tell you otherwise, which is that from the, uh, from the Soviet perspective, the, uh, the organized communist underground was also spontaneous in that it was not authorized by the Communist Party. Um, uh, and so what happened after the war, I mean, as far as these little groups of people who uh, engaged in resistance themselves, I'm not sure that the Soviet authorities even knew very much about that. But they did know about the organized communist resistance. And what happened was that Ponomaryenko, who was the head of the uh, Belarusian Communist Party and who had fled Minsk in the first days of the war, wound up in Moscow, became the head of the Soviet partisan movement, sent a uh, radiogram to the partisan units surrounding Minsk in November of 1942, uh, in which he said that uh, the uh, underground movement in Minsk was a German operation. It had been created by the Germans uh, in order to catch, uh, uh, to trap Soviet patriots, and that if anybody came to a partisan unit from the Minsk underground, they should be interrogated and possibly arrested. And being arrested, of course, meant being shot. Um, and so that's what happened. And a number of people from the Minsk underground were shot in partisan units. And after the war, Ponomaryenko and his underlings maintained this story. When they came back to Minsk and took power after the war, uh, they, may, they continued to insist that the Minsk underground had been a treasonous operation. And they threw many, of, many survivors of the Minsk underground into labor camps. Uh, at least 122. I examined the records of those people at the KGB archives. Um, there was a, uh, and by that time, by the way, there was plenty of evidence that the Minsk underground was a legit legitimate underground. But one of the things that Ponomaryenko said was, this was organized without our authorization. Therefore, obviously, it was anti-Soviet. Um, now, it was also true that when Ponomaryenko and the others got to Minsk and got to Moscow, one of the members of the Central Committee was asked by a Soviet official, why did you people leave so fast? What did you do about organizing an evacuation? And the man who was asked this, a man named Gorbunov, said, well, I happened to be visiting my family in Gomel, which is you know, on the, the eastern edge, you know, in Vitebsk he was, actually. And so he said, I had no choice. I could only come to Moscow, but I'll go back and ask the others what the answer to this is. So he went back and reported this question to Ponomaryenko. Well, Ponomaryenko knew that you could be executed for less, for having left Minsk without having organized an evacuation. So he, Ponomaryenko pulled his staff together and they concocted a story about the massive evacu evacuation of communists that they had organized from Minsk uh, in the first days of the war. And they fed this story to the, uh, uh, to the Soviet press. A uh, full page article appeared in Pravda about the massive Minsk evacuation of communists. So when a communist underground then appears in Minsk, it's very embarrassing to Ponomaryenko. Because if all the communists were evacuated, why all of a sudden was there a communist underground? So my reading of it is that Ponomaryenko was trying to save his own skin. So that's the answer to your first question. The, um, the answer about anti-Semitism is, um, well, all I can tell you is what my interviewees told me. And this, by the way, at a certain point in the project, I decided that the question of relations between Jews and Belarusians before and after the war was so interesting that it deserved a little research of its own. 
And so I did a series of interviews with my interviewees in Minsk, specifically on that question. They all told me that before the war, uh, among kids, teenagers, Nobody knew the difference. They said everybody was friends with everybody else. It really was not an important question. After the war, they said it was a different matter. Um, so then I went to Israel, and I interviewed uh, survivors of the Minsk ghetto in Israel, and I asked them the same question. I expected that I would get a very different answer in Israel. What was shocking to me was that I did not. I got exactly the same answer. Um, they said uh, relations between Jews and Belarusians in Minsk before the war were so good that one woman said, um, this has served as an inspiration to me for the rest of my life uh, about what relations between people of different ethnic groups could be like. Now, I assume I was, I interviewed a whole group of ghetto survivors together. I would assume these were Russian Jews. I would assume that their politics were the politics of Russian Jews in Israel. You know, I asked them, by the way, about communism. They said, oh, yeah, we believed in communism then, but, you know, it became a little more complicated afterwards. Um, they all insisted that the sharp, uh, uh, turn towards anti-Semitism after the war, which really was very sharp and very dramatic, was state-driven. Uh, they said it was not the fault of the Belarusians. They, one man said to me, you know, you could go into a bar or something and you'd probably hear things you wouldn't like, you know. There are people like that in every society. But he said, on the whole, the Belarusians were correct. Our problem was with the state. focused on uh, resistance movements or whatever in the 60s and 70s? Did I mishear that? You mean in the United States? Yes, exactly. So what connections, what commonalities did you find between uh, this group in uh, Minsk and, um, and, and our own country? You know, the contexts are so different that, I mean, I was not looking for commonalities. Um, because in the United States in the 1960s, you know, though we talked about state repression, you know, it was nothing like uh, what people faced in the occupied Soviet Union. First from the, uh, the Nazis, and then, as I've just said, from the Soviets when they returned. And so I think it was, it was such a different context that I would have a hard time giving you commonalities, except maybe for the fact that young people played a very major role in both. And actually, I'll add something else, which is that women played a major role in the ghetto resistance, uh, you know, as they did, obviously, in the, the movements of the 60s in the United States. You know, not in the name of feminism. Feminism was not an issue, but women were probably uh, uh, I don't know, maybe about a third of the members of the, um, of the ghetto underground. Thank you very much, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. OK, we're going to see this short uh, DVD about the Memorial Grove uh, that's out in the Alumni Grove. And uh, as I said, after it's over, you can bring your papers up. And I hope to see some of you on Sunday. Three o'clock.
that I remember it. And if we don't remind the, the younger generation, it can be is 
going to be internally illuminated. So at nightfall, the memorial grove will be very subtly illuminated from the inside of the, of the glass tower. Most all of my work deals with social and political and personal issues. And I thought this was a good opportunity to explore an area of, of social concern, not only to me personally, but hopefully to society in general. The lecture series was started by a group of survivors and social activists at Sonoma State with a goal of learning and remembering in the service of prevention. And I think that what we now also need to do is to preserve for posterity the memories of people who have been victims of genocide and to give people the ability to memorialize those people. I think it's a wonderful way to have expose students and educate students on the Armenian genocide and all genocides because this row is actually going to be a multi-genocidal row which I believe is probably one of its kind. You know, a hundred years from now we're going to be in show people that these are the names of my people. We are dead, they can go and still find that uh, structure. So for me, I think any kind of uh, physical structure is, is part of the whole remembrance and it can help people to go from there. I've gotten to meet people whose lives were also touched by other genocides. And I really see the parallels in, in their experience and my experience and the need for us to reach out to the next generations, particularly as the generation of those who survived the Holocaust is slipping away from us. So it actually validates for the Armenians a place to go where, you know, a place of higher learning um, acknowledges that it did happen, it does exist, and here's a physical representation for that. I know how important it's going to be both for this campus, for the community, and for keeping the memory of genocide very much a presence as we begin to teach more and more students on this campus. We put this DVD together because we're hoping that you might be willing and interested in participating in the development of this grove. The grove will have, as described, um, the tracks, but we will also have commemorative bricks which will be available for individuals and families and groups to be able to inscribe the names of people that they would like to remember or in some way testimony about their participation in Holocaust or other genocides. People will be able to choose between a symbol for the Holocaust, Cambodian, Rwandan, Armenian, or other genocides. We have two types of bricks available. One will be a four by eight, which will be available for $100, and another eight by eight, that will be $250. You may purchase these bricks by contacting Kate McClintock of the Alumni Office at Sonoma State. She may be reached at area code 707-664-2693 or at Kate dot mcclintock at sonoma.edu. Please join us. We're excited to have you participate in this project. If you can't, if you can't make it on Sunday, I invite you to go over to the Alumni Grove, and the bricks are in now, and it's really quite moving. Thanks very much, and see you the week after. Oh, Barbara's books are for sale if you're interested. You can come back in and have her sign them.